Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. We're talking today to Tim Belknap. In early December, he set up a small, brightly lit room inside Temple Gallery that he calls his space station. The almost convincing replica is a conceptual art project and an educational tool. Tim is performing live as Astronaut Tim for a class of fourth graders in Philadelphia Public School. A live video Skype brings him and the space station to the students in their classroom across town. Through some mechanical trickery, astronaut Tim looks like he's floating in a zero-gravity environment. We're speaking with Belknap at Temple Gallery. So, um, the name of the piece is actually Destiny Module, is that right? Yeah, it's based on the Destiny Module, which is one of the several modules that are attached to the space station. So. And is that real? I mean, this yeah. mm-hmm. okay, because yeah. I'm, I'm at a point now where I don't know what's real and what's <laughs> not real. <laughs> now, Destiny's the U.S. lab, a science lab. It's where they do most of the experiments in space. And when you started out making this piece, were you thinking that it was going to be, um, that it was going to be so real? <laughs> no, no. Originally, when I wanted to do this, well, I've had this idea for a couple years now, and it's sort of transformed from early Mystery Science Theater 2000, going through Sesame Street. I mean, it's gone through adding puppets, and then I removed the puppets. That was also when I wasn't sure how I wanted to represent myself, whether it's as an astronaut or as somebody who's just pretending to be in space. So now I've left it up to the teachers to decide on how they talk to their class about their interaction with me. Um, I did have one teacher, and I won't mention names, who did not know I was not a real astronaut. I thought it was pretty clear in our earlier communication, but I just recently heard from my helper that she was like, I did not know. This is fake. So if I'm a student sitting in that class, what do I see? Um, So my helper would come in and set up a computer and a projector and turn it on Uh, immediately the camera would turn you know the projector would turn on it'd be a close-up of me because I'm actually turning on my computer as well and then I push myself back on a I'm suspended from a gantry and I push myself back into the space so then the students normally then see me floating in space or what seems you know me floating in space and that's normally when I get the big wow the first exciting wow (laughs) And do they think you're a real astronaut then? You've convinced them? Yeah. I, I think as soon as they see me suspended in midair, and I, I immediately start, well, I immediately start kicking my legs around to really, <laughs> what's nice is technology has allowed me to do this, but it's not, the quality isn't good enough that you see the wires, so it, it's really believable convincingly. So what sort of questions do the kids ask you? It was a little bit selfish, the, the, the earlier programming for me I, I, is what I wanted to tell them about the space station, the whole sort of NASA, you know, uh, closing its doors right now. But I've actually then realized that I needed to really be supportive to the teachers and actually be educational. I, I think that, I mean, I had to like get into the no child left behind and see what requirements are for science so so that's also how I figured out what grade would have been best it's just that they're learning the con you know those those planets um and they, they understand space and they're starting to learn about elements and you know gas turning into you, you know condensing into liquids or solids the, the transformations that can happen which are really interesting in happening in some of the planets as well like Jupiter, it goes from gas to liquid to solid. So it's really nice that they're able to also understand that concept. So, And then also to introduce like famous astronauts that are local. There's, we have two local famous astronauts. Yeah, who um, are they? Oh, oh okay, oh. cut to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where's my... Watch me do this performance. You see poster boards <laughs> splattered all around the... the this the camera because I'm just reading. I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, the questions they ask are, 
I just, there'd be not enough poster board in the world to like answer all the questions they get. I mean, recently, yesterday was talking about how man wasn't the first in space. We had early animals that went up. So Albert was the first monkey and he did it in 1940, some, I think 46. And I was, I, how did he get there? I, somebody, <laughs> well, one of the students <laughs> asked that, well, how did the monkey fly? And I was like, well, it was more as though we just sort of threw a ball really high. It just sort of went out of the atmosphere and right back in. So it wasn't, there's no flying. It's just sort of hold on tight. But then the, another student was like, did Albert live? And I mean, I, I was like, why? Well, this is really sad. I was like, no, Albert didn't make it. And actually the like next three monkeys, their deaths are horrid. I mean, they're like, they suffocate. I mean, it's just, her, but I was Did like, you tell the well, I said the this? monkey, I said, Albert didn't make it, but many others have. Um, and then later you could, um, my assistant heard her talking to the teacher and, and was like, is that why monkeys are extinct? Cause they sent them all into space. And the teacher is like, monkeys aren't extinct. Oh my gosh. So I get a lot of random questions. I did have one class that was really focused on the end of the world. I think those are the tough things to answer. Because if it's just like, is the moon a cookie, which I got. I mean, I'm pretty confident in my answer about that. But like, when is the earth going to explode? I'm, I'm, I mean, that was the first time somebody asked me sort of a life and death question. And I, I didn't know how to answer that. So I just sort of snapped out of character and was like, relax. It's okay. Like, earth is fine. It's a great place. So, Tim, you're a conceptual artist. Can you tell us where this conceptual art piece came from? Did you always want to be an astronaut? Yeah. I've always been curious about exploration. I, I think it, I think it's, uh, it's where my curiosity is tied into with NASA. I don't want to be a rocket scientist, but I am curious about thinking what could we do next? Like, what would be, like, what are our limits? Where is that line of what I'm capable of doing? Because a lot of my work is the boundaries are really unclear to the viewer. I mean, I've done several pieces where it's like, I, it's finished because I've presented it to you. But how far could the piece have gone? I mean, the, the boundaries are, are set just because it's sort of presented to you. But in terms of like how I'm crafting and making it, the piece fully developing and changing. And so I think with this piece... What well, allowed, allowed me to really like define the boundaries and see if I can really achieve and push myself to really be educational and actually challenging to to them. And let's talk about playful, because a lot of your works are rather mischievous and playful. If we think back on them, um, you had a was it a hot dog truck in your Fleischer Challenge exhibit? Ice cream truck? Yeah, it was a futuristic sort of. Well, it, it, the whole purpose of that truck, I. Sw- Whopped out and put a biodiesel in and solar panels on top. And the whole thing was that the truck that pulled and powered the incubator for the pineapple behind it. So I'd been growing a pineapple plant for two years. So yeah, so the truck was just sort of keep, it was a lifeline. It was the mother of this sort of trailer that was growing the, you know, the pineapple in the incubator. How long do your uh, projects incubate? About two years, it seems. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna guess two years. Yeah. So, where did you get your sense of humor from? My father, I think, would be the. Uh, he's sort of a prankster, which has caused a lot of problems. Because, well, my father, we, we he would drive us around when we were all kids, and I'm from a family of there's six of us. Um, six kids. Yes. And all he would, boys. Or? No, the last two were girls. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> I think my mother agrees with that. Um, so he'd drive us around, and we lived out in the woods, so he'd be driving through, you know, a different, he'd change and just go a different way, but in, like halfway into the trip, he'd be like, oh, we're lost. I don't know where we're going. Like, oh, we're never going to make it back home. I don't know, kids. Looks like we're living somewhere else now. And none of us would cry, but we'd be like, but... I want to go back, you know, no more friends. We've lost our friends. And so he, he would do things like that. And when he was little, he 
uh, him and his friend used to stand at a road and tell other cars, oncoming cars, that the road, bridge was out, even though there was no bridge on that road. And would have them reroute, to go, go like another like 15 minutes out of the way to go around this road that had a yeah, fake bridge out. It was diabolical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know if I should say this, but my dad is convinced that his humor is for the fact that he was hit by a truck. And he's like, oh, that changed me. He's convinced that anything that, like, good or bad that happens in his life is like, it's all because of that truck that I was hit by. He's a, he's a character. Um, so I'm thinking about how, um, how looking at televised and uh, cinematic images of space, which are rather different from real images from space, what do you think is the greater influence for you and, and what you were going for? I, I wanted the experience of that they were actually talking to somebody in space that was actually experiencing something as as mysterious as floating. So I wanted there to be this real a reality that they could interact with and really ask me questions about how do you sleep and in that reality, I think I think there is then a lot more playful and more. Um, I think that's where you could go more. And you know, the students themselves sort of thought about other movies or other things that they have seen. So it is more of a just sort of a springboard for them to go off into other recalling other memories that they might have or experiences viewing somebody in anti gravity. I mean, which is also why I think I got a lot of questions that re- seemed. Just, Cinematic, um, when are asteroids crashing into the Earth, was several of them, and when is the Earth exploded? I mean, all these questions, I, I mean, there's no reason they would have them other than having witnessed them on apocalyptic films that are out there. All right, Independence Day yeah. and all those, yeah. I mean, originally I did not want it to be realistic. Originally the whole idea was that it would be much more, like, Early PBS Mr. Body was, he just sort of, it's incredibly strange. He wore this sort of complete bodysuit that had all the organs, and then he would just talk about the human body and running and muscles. And he, I mean, but his presentation now looking back was incredibly, I mean, like, he could have just wore like a doctor's jacket and shown images, but for the fact that he felt like the best explanation and best way to, really show the body was to wear a skin-tight bodysuit with organs painted on it. it was, that is weird. Yeah, that yeah, is I'm incredibly... With that one. Yeah, but um, he, I mean, he would sort of... I mean, we were always re- interested in what he was talking about because he'd be like, oh, how does the kidneys work? And so the presentation was sort of skewed and awkward and weird, but the information was really, re- it was really interesting. So I originally thought maybe, maybe I would not be as creepy but as as unique as well in terms of when i was thinking more puppetry and how, how you know um but then so no i i sort of regrounded it in more reality i'm trying to always think about um is certain enjoyment in life tied to being either naive or being innocent, I mean, is, is, is some enjoyments just gone because I know too much? These students see me floating in space, and they have a, a real enjoyment because they just don't, I mean, they're willing to suspend their disbelief, and they're willing to to be innocent and believe. And so a lot of my work is about this sort of trying to find enjoyments in life and, like, what what is lost because I'm no longer innocent that I can't experience anymore. Well, we've been speaking with Tim Belknap this morning. Tim, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been wonderful. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.